In July of 2006, Elon Musk provided two of his cousins, Peter and Lyndon Reeve, with $10 million in startup capital to create a solar energy installation company. Then he assigned himself as chairman of the board of that company with 22% of available shares. By December of 2012, SolarCity had enough of a market share to warrant an $8 IPO on the NASDAQ, and in just 13 months, the share price hit a record high of $88.35. A decade after incorporation, Musk and his cousins then sold SolarCity to Tesla for a $6 billion combination of Tesla stock and debt acquisition, with SolarCity shares closing at only $20.36 on their last day of trading, November 18, 2016, down 78% from their all-time high. This presentation is going to dissect that transaction and demonstrate exactly what Musk sold shareholders of his only remaining publicly traded company, which itself was also apparently on the verge of bankruptcy. There are three tangents we're going to touch on over the course of this multi-part episode, which all demonstrate just how intertwined all of Musk's grand ventures are, which rarely, if ever, benefit Tesla shareholders or anybody other than Musk. All information referred to in this episode is cited by the website where the information was discovered. Viewers can verify information at their own convenience by searching for the quotes on the source shown. And although this is a very long episode, we encourage everybody to watch it all the way through and each part, because we believe that this scenario is very indicative of every company Musk is involved with. According to Wikipedia, SolarCity was founded July 4, 2006, with Musk as chairman, Peter Reeve as CEO, and Lyndon Reeve as CTO, Chief of Technology. The new company grew quickly, and in just three years, SolarCity installations were already generating 440 megawatts of power, roughly equivalent to the Tom Sock Hydroelectric Dam in Missouri. In its heyday, the company was considered to be one of the top solar installation companies in North America. This was despite offering no clear solar technological advantage compared to other players in the same space. The MIT Technology Review, in fact, described their business model as simply a better way to use existing technology. All their panel technology was either purchased from other suppliers or acquired from other companies bought out by SolarCity rather than developed in-house prior to 2017. Companies such as REC Group, Trina Solar, and Canadian Solar provided the lion's share of the components that SolarCity installed, with additional sourcing from LG and Hanwha Q cells in 2016. Even the power walls that were unveiled by Tesla in June 2015 as a storage solution for solar arrays had to be purchased at retail from Tesla, who had developed the product independently. SolarCity started buying up competitors such as Clean Currents and Grow Solar in 2011, then Paramount Solar in 2013, spreading their operations to the East Coast and doubling their energy production to 870 megawatts by 2015, accounting for 28% of non-utility domestic solar energy production nationwide. On December 14, 2012, SolarCity was listed on the NASDAQ under the symbol SCTY with an IPO price of $8, which shot up to $13 in pre-trading to close at $11.72 on the first day of trading, then dropped down to a record low of $10.11 a week later before recovering and starting an upward trend. Another hyped up Musk bandwagon for people to buy into to make their millions. In October 2014, despite their shares trading in the mid-50s, Solar City needed to issue the first ever solar bonds to raise operating capital through their new website, and SpaceX bought $90 million of the $200 million in bonds on offer. SpaceX would go on to buy over a quarter billion dollars in SolarCity bonds by the spring of 2016, using money it really had no business using for this purpose. And that brings us to our first tangent. A bit of SpaceX backstory here, taken from the Wikipedia entry for NASA's Commercial Crew Development Awards. In 2011, SpaceX was selected by NASA to be part of their Commercial Crew Development Program competition and awarded $75 million in the second round of the competition to develop a crewed version of their Dragon capsule with a human-rated Dragon launch vehicle. Another $440 million was awarded to them in the August of 2012. In the final round, announced September 2014, SpaceX was awarded another $2.6 billion towards the development of Crew Dragon. But instead, Musk took a combined $255 million of taxpayers' money and sunk it into SolarCity bonds, 
over the course of the next 21 months. It bears noting that SpaceX was contracted to produce prototypes of this human-rated craft by 2016, with test flights beginning in 2017, but the Crew Dragon did not wind up flying astronauts to the ISS until 2020. The first in-flight abort test was originally scheduled for July of 2015, and that didn't happen until January 19, 2020, almost five years behind schedule. One of the biggest delays SpaceX faced was due to the Falcon 9 explosion on the SLC-40 pad in September of 2016. That incident destroyed the vehicle, the pad itself, and the $244 million satellite owned by Facebook, designed to beam high-speed internet into Africa. The loss of that satellite set Facebook back at least four years, while SpaceX went on to launch their Starlink constellation. Now, if there are any conspiracy theorists here, this is the timeline to question. Facebook and Utelsat started developing their Amos 6 satellite in the June of 2012. Six months later, SpaceX is selected as the launch provider. Two years later, Musk announces Starlink, seemingly out of nowhere. The following year, Facebook's $244 million satellite is destroyed in an explosion on the launch pad. 17 months later, Musk starts launching Starlink satellites. In September of 2020, Facebook finally managed to develop and launch another prototype satellite, and they chose France's Ariane Space, not SpaceX, as their launch provider. Also, one has to wonder if the $255 million worth of NASA's money had stayed in the Crew Dragon program, whether or not SpaceX could have delivered their human-rated vehicles on time, thereby saving NASA from spending billions more dollars buying seats on the Russian Soyuz craft to deliver U.S. astronauts to the ISS. Since the beginning of 2016, 20 American astronauts have had to buy tickets on Soyuz vehicles, mainly on the Soyuz MS, for an average cost of $81 million per seat, and that's over $1.6 billion extra dollars NASA had to fork out because SpaceX didn't stick to their schedule. That cost is rising to $90 million per seat for upcoming launches, and it is conceivable that SpaceX's investment in SolarCity played a part in these delays. So did Musk's preoccupation with his newest toy at the time, his intercolonial transport, now known as Starship, for which Musk was publicly called out in 2019 by NASA boss Jim Bridenstein, who was getting fed up hearing about Starship while SpaceX had thus far failed to deliver the Crew Dragon. Time to get back to the main story here, but maybe now you'll understand a little better when we tell you we've gone down the rabbit hole when we start digging a little deeper into stories. Back to Solar City, and despite being heralded as one of the top solar companies in the world, Solar City had apparently been hemorrhaging cash for most of the time it was in business. The company's 10K filing from the company's height in 2015 even told readers the trouble the company was in. To save this failing company, Musk announced in June of 2016 that Tesla would be buying SolarCity for a premium of 21-30% to 30 on their share price. According to the Buffalo News, SolarCity's debt had grown from $48 million at the end of 2011 to $3.4 billion as of their publication date of November 15, 2016, just days before the shareholders were to vote on the acquisition. Rather than recusing himself with regards to the shareholder vote as he declared he had done, Musk was leading the charge for this deal to happen, declaring it a no-brainer in multiple interviews. To hear Musk talk about the company, he would have you believe it was a tremendous success, and they were about to release a brand new product that was going to change the world to corner the residential solar installation market. See, for whatever reason, Musk seems to have an almost pathological need to completely exaggerate what his companies are doing, making outlandish claims or promoting ridiculous concepts that deny logic and reason. We already have over a dozen videos on this channel that have just started to scratch that surface. Our episode on Neuralink illustrates this perfectly. There are apparently dozens of PhDs and technologists at Neuralink working on a brain mapping interface that hopes to connect the minds of amputees to the mechanics of their motorized prosthetics. But Musk feels the need to lie and tell the world you can use it for telepathy, playing video games in your head, to learn skills by downloading them to your brain, and then to transfer your soul to a younger body. This type of deception also happened at Solar City. The company installed rooftop solar components from other manufacturers like every other solar installer out there, 
but Musk had to promise shareholders a revolutionary roofing tile system that would corner the residential solar market to seal the deal. In the week prior to his shareholder vote, Musk orchestrated the unveiling of a brand new product line for Solar City, the Solar Roof Tiles. He brought a gallery of spectators and cameras to the set of Desperate Housewives, and with great fanfare proudly told everyone in attendance that these houses were now solar powered using these new devices. The panels looked just like normal roofing materials because, in effect, that's all they were. Despite Musk's claim to the contrary, none of these roofs were functional, and every tile was a non-functional prop. The biggest issue surrounding the claim wasn't that these tiles didn't work, and have never worked. No, the issue was Musk promised they did work while he was convincing his Tesla's shareholders to acquire this company. This was an orchestrated deception. Green Tech Media's Jillian Spector wrote a retrospective on these devices describing the ongoing issues with this failed promise and reminded us that, to date, no other company has pulled off a solar shingle tile. See, what shareholders probably didn't realize while they listened to Musk's unscrupulous showman performance is that many other companies had tried to make this device a reality and they all failed. Surprise, surprise, Musk didn't come up with this idea. Original patents for integrated solar roofing shingles go back to the 1970s. This particular patent is dated 1977, and did you notice who the patent holder was? NASA. The US government, through NASA, filed a patent for a solar rooftop shingle design on August 24, 1976. Many others tried the solar shingle concept and failed. For example, Beamreach, formerly Solexel, burned through $250 million in funding and grants trying to develop the concept before going bankrupt in 2017. Probably the biggest player who tried the solar shingle space was Dow, with its powerhouse line of products dating back to 2009. It was named as one of Time Magazine's best inventions of 2009, despite the fact Dow didn't invent the idea. The company believed it would be a $10 billion cash cow by 2020, but the product never lived up to expectations, including cost-effectiveness. Reportedly, only 1,000 Dow powerhouse roofs were ever installed, and the product line was abandoned in June of 2016. In 2017, one of the original American long-standing solar companies called RGS licensed the Dow product to produce Powerhouse 3.0 tiles. They had been pioneers in the solar industry since 1977, but three years after taking on solar shingle licenses, they declared bankruptcy after 42 years in business. So Lexel couldn't do it, Dow couldn't do it, RGS couldn't do it. In fact, in mid-August of 2016, Green Tech Media's Eric Wessoff wrote an article addressed directly to Musk and the Brothers Reef, showing them many other companies on record at the time as having gone bankrupt or suffered terribly at the hands of attempting similar alternative solar products. And still, Musk somehow convinced his shareholders during his October 28, 2016 live product reveal on the set of Desperate Housewives that Solar City had figured it all out. Little did they know that the shingles they were being shown were useless, non-functional props. On November 17, 2016, enough of the Tesla shareholders bought Musk's deceptive sales pitch and voted under that blanket of deception to pay billions of dollars for an almost worthless company and its additional billions of dollars in debt. But that vote was far from unanimous. After the acquisition, shareholders likely expected that the Solar City assets would be reorganized into a well-oiled machine they would be ramping up to make good on the promises made to them by their own chairman and CEO. But the exact opposite happened. In fact, according to TheFool.com, six months after the acquisition, Tesla Energy products had not yet shown up in Tesla storefronts. The same article reports how Tesla had pulled the plug on its door-to-door -door sales program, and a follow-up article in the Billings Gazette described the company's current condition as gutted. See, this was around the same time Tesla was having a lot of trouble making good on several promises relating to their Model 3. So what Musk did was he moved key people from Solar City, now called Tesla Energy, over to the automotive side of the company to address those problems. This is not speculation, this is now sworn testimony provided by Musk himself, who also testified that Model 3 milestones weren't being met and Tesla was in danger of going under. So Musk gutted SolarCity's personnel as he saw fit, leaving the already struggling solar division to their own devices. And then Musk started taking those away as well. 
If there was any doubt at all that Tesla Energy was in trouble, June 2018 put those doubts to rest. This was the day Tesla cut 9% of its entire workforce. Most of the 4,100 people affected were salaried employees. The same day it was announced that Tesla would be pulling out their proprietary kiosks from the 800 Home Depot stores and canceling their arrangement with the only major retailer carrying their products. Ten days later, Tesla closed the first dozen of their solar installation centers, including some in California, where a mandate for new homes to be equipped with renewable energy was already in the works. This was even worse than October of 2017, where a previous round of layoffs and blindside firings took an estimated 1,200 employees off the Tesla payroll, including many from Solar City, as the once unstoppable solar segment lost any market advantage it once held. Q3 2017 solar installations dropped 42% year over year to 109 megawatts, with only 87 megawatts in Q4 2017. These 2017 layoffs were right around the same time disaster hit Puerto Rico, and Musk saw this unfolding situation as an opportunity to use the crisis to his advantage. Let us tell you how well that worked out with our second tangent. On September 6, 2017, a Category 5 hurricane named Irma slammed the Leeward Islands to the east of Puerto Rico and carved a trail of destruction across the main island. This storm plunged one million people into darkness as the aging electrical infrastructure was decimated in the storm. All told, Irma was responsible for around $50 billion in damage. On September 20th, 2017, Cat 5 Hurricane Maria hit the island directly, blew weakened buildings apart, flooded much of the island, and destroyed what remained of their aging infrastructure and power grid. Damage estimates for Maria alone topped $90 billion, making it the worst storm in Puerto Rico's history. Post-storm estimates coming out of the area said it could take months or even years to get electricity back up and running. Musk saw an opportunity in this disaster to benefit his lagging solar company by offering to lend, not donate, solar systems and power walls to organizations in Puerto Rico to get the power back on. October 6, Electric was reporting Musk and the territory's governor, Ricardo Rossello, were in touch through Twitter regarding a possible plan of action. A week later, Tesla claimed to have deployed hundreds of technicians to Puerto Rico with equipment to install at 600 locations across the island that would be free at first, but would have to be paid for later. Unfortunately, Musk had no idea what he was sending his people into, and Daily Cause reported that the project itself was a disaster. As the Huffington Post reported in their follow-up article of May 11, 2019, here's what followed. Within months, most of the equipment Tesla sent down had fallen into disrepair, having never been used. One system that was connected to the Ciudad Dorada Senior Center immediately blew out the power packs when it was connected to the building. As a result, the system has never worked and still sits there, useless, as a large diesel generator burns through fuel to keep their lights on. They also installed a system for a water treatment facility that was never used and has since become a solar panel graveyard, overgrown and damaged by the wild horses that roam the island. And yet another system set up at the Viquez Hospital was abandoned since the hospital was condemned due to damage and mold. As Edgar Oscar Ruiz, a Puerto Rican activist for renewable energy on the islands, told the Huffington Post in 2019, Tesla came in with great intentions, but that's not enough. As of the writing of that article, the island of Iquez still relies on dirty power and the solar equipment sits useless and broken. And as it turns out, their intentions weren't that great to begin with. It was all a PR stunt. The media was quick to give out the accolades, but very few news organizations bothered reporting Musk's failure to deliver, which has now become a pattern. Throughout 2018, although the Tesla Energy Storage Division seemed to be on the rise, retrofit solar panel installations continued to drop, and in Q4 2018, they were down 21% from Q3, down 38% from the previous year, with a total of only 326 megawatts installed on the year. In February of 2019, in an effort to stem the bleeding and continued loss of market share, reports came out on Reuters that Tesla was dropping its showroom program in favor of a strictly online sales platform offering standardized solar packages, but obviously not solar roof tiles. As Frank Gillette, principal analyst at Forrester Research accurately stated at the time, solar is now the stepchild at Tesla. 
they've made two decisions in a row that deal crippling blows to their solar business. As Tesla was shutting down many of its retail locations, there were two more rounds of layoffs, 8% in March of 2019, preceded by a 7% cut in workforce the previous February. These layoffs came on the heels of fourth quarter reports that solar sales had fallen off a cliff, going from a 33.5% market share in 2016 to just 9.1%. In the fourth quarter of 2018, they had installed a mere 73 megawatts of solar, compared to 272 megawatts in the fourth quarter of 2015, a 75% decline. And the most recent quarterly numbers from Tesla Energy would have salespeople jumping for joy to hit that number this year. Q2 2020 reports that the division had its worst quarter ever, dropping to a microscopic 27 megawatts. Perhaps the highly publicized fires in 2019 have something to do with this continued exodus. In August of 2019, news agencies were reporting that Walmart was taking Tesla Energy to court over a series of fires caused by commercial installations at seven of their properties as of November 2018. Walmart went so far as to demand Tesla remove their equipment from all 244 stores that had been installed, cover all the cost of those removals, the loss of business, and the damage to property, setting gross negligence as the basis of their claim. In their filings, Walmart started doing their own diggings into the Tesla purchase of Solar City, setting gross negligence in their installations and in their maintenance. Amazon chimed in once the court battle became public knowledge, stating a Tesla Energy Solar Array caused a fire at their warehouse in Redlands, California in June of 2018, and that they would not be buying any more Tesla products as a result. As a point of interest, that same warehouse burned to the ground in June of 2020, and the cause of that fire has not yet been determined. Then residential customers started coming forward, saying how their Tesla arrays had caught fire and damaged or destroyed their homes. Brianna Greer was fortunate enough that a quick response by neighbors and the local fire department saved her house with minimal damage, but others such as Ken Tomasello were not as lucky. And while people were having their houses torched by their green energy devices, Tesla was about to watch a strategic partnership go up in smoke. And that's how we're going to start off part two of this presentation. Get up and stretch, grab a drink, and click the link when you are ready to go with part two.